And when they're shouting and bawling at each other in the meeting, are you understanding it all, or are you just nodding, going, yeah? He's oh, no, right. look at we got a translator there. So, when the, so the translator gets translating swear words. Shit! <laughs> Shit! Yeah. Shit! Shit! Shit. Yeah, <laughs> But I remember seeing you, um, you're having a coffee, but you're spooning like uh, brown sugar straight from the spoon into your mouth. So you no went, doubt, that's, <laughs> mate, that's me. <laughs> you just said you were going to be nice. I thought we were going to tell you're a story about being nice. Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Ryan. Big Jim and Goody are with me as usual. We'll be going through all the action from a busy weekend of Champions Cup as the pool stage drew to a close. Plus... We're we'll joined by Montpellier back rower Zach Mercer and Edinburgh head coach Mike Blair. So settle back, enjoy, and make sure you're subscribed on Spotify. Pod, 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 pod. Rugby pod. Jim, you're looking very tanned. Yeah, I, I'm back. Andrew, let's get something out of the way with for the listeners know, because you talk about chasing your tail. We've just recorded for about 10 minutes, so I didn't press record on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the thing. So, lads, everything I say now, just laugh again. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. keep it raw. Because I didn't press record, I'm chasing my tail a bit. Yes, I am tanned, Andrew. Thanks for the positivity, but I've got a bit of negativity, and I'll re go to say what I just said. Of course, I have. I left my iPad on the plane, lads. So what? I've not seen any ruggers, um, like I just mentioned, because I promised Beck on the last two days of holiday because my screen time was up four or five hours, and justifiably, I was on the news. You know, I was just educating myself the, the old time, educating Rita, but. I, I didn't. I, I didn't catch any ruggers. Like one, we mentioned being geo blocked last week, and because I was fluking it a little bit, obviously someone's blocked me. I don't know how. I don't know how Siri works and all that. When you're on the lead by, obviously the laws and the rules and stuff are very strong, as you know, Andrew. So I because you know, you're an influenza. Well, I'm an influenza, but I didn't want to get my arm chopped off or anything for geo blocking. So I didn't <laughs> want to push it anymore. Um, so I haven't seen a lot of ruggers. I've seen a couple of headlines since I've been home. I've seen that Fordy's back in the England team. Where he should be, and um, well, squad to start off with. Yeah, yeah. Well, team squad. I mean, who knows? I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about now. I'm, I'm out of sorts, lads. I have not seen any ruggers this weekend. I know that Was got humped, <laughs> and I know that the Bath game was close. I've basically seen the results. How you... Montpellier beat in Exeter, but we'll go through it in a bit. Oh, how's your week been anyway, Goody? Yeah, not bad. Uh, tiring, actually. Um, I say tiring. It's Monday. I had uh, a quick in and out. I say a quick in and out. A long day in and out of Ireland yesterday. Uh, I had a taxi pick me up at like 6.30 in the morning to take me to Heathrow to fly into Dublin to get a three-hour taxi down to Limerick to get to uh, Tome Park, which was great to see and be at, but there was no food there, so I was absolutely fucking starving. Uh, there was no shops around Tome Park. I'm like, Deliveroo, got the Deliveroo app, see if anyone would deliver a McDonald's. There was nothing going on at all. They've just come out of lockdown, so they weren't prepared for it. I'm like, where's the burger van? There's no burger van. And I'm there all day, absolutely starving. And it boiled down to, obviously, doing the commentary with BT Sport, um, obviously, on the game, which was great. Fro taxi to Shannon Airport. Taxi driver telling us, I'm like, drivers, let's stop off somewhere, get some food. He's like, I'm telling you, there's a really nice restaurant at Shannon Airport once you go through security. I said, mate, are you telling me that's definitely going to be open? He's like, I promise you. There's three flights going out there tonight. I know it. It's open. Gets to the airport. There's a bar with crisps and Guinness. That's it. So my diet yesterday was basically I had breakfast at Heathrow Airport at six, a couple of bottles of Coke during the game, a couple of bottles of water, four pints of Guinness responsible at the airport with three back packets of crisps. So um, got home at one o'clock this morning, absolutely shattered. And here we are the next day. So... I've probably got about as much sleep as Jim Hamilton with four kids on a plane with his knees around his ears, but he's, at least he's got a suntan for it. So, um, yeah, busy weekend. I should say, as we're recording the podcast, that the playoff with not watching any rugby at the weekend and being on my phone longer than five hours was the fact that I was going to get extra leg of the room on the way home and Beck would sit four rows back with the kids. So I am well rested. But if I am slow in my speech, that's because my body clock's out of check and... Basically, I'll be honest, I had about four or five pints on the plane, but that's that's fine. <laughs> I mean, basically for be breakfast responsibly. But I'm warming up for the live shows, lads. Uh, Goody, quickly, before we segue into full-on ruggers, was there fans in Munster? Yeah. Four. Yeah, there was. There was 10,000. It wasn't ram-packed um, because ultimately the Irish government brought them out of lockdown on the Saturday morning. I mean, who just does it on a Saturday morning? Anyway, apparently in Ulster on Saturday evening... 
uh, it was ram-packed because everyone just thought we've been locked down, we're going to a game. Um, and then Munster on Sunday, there was a, I think there was a few sore heads. So there's only 10,000 there on Sunday, but it was still bouncing, uh, obviously relevant to the, the performance from Munster and Zebo and all the boys as well. But it was, there were, there were fans, there were loads of them. So, and let me tell you, one big positive around going to Limerick and being flying into Dublin and being in a taxi and all this stuff, everywhere I went, people are loving the podcast. There was a lot of love from the Irish public on the plane in Limerick when we got there at the stadium. Loads of people coming up and saying, mate, love the podcast. So, uh, yeah, massive thank you to everyone over in Ireland who loves us. Don't know why. I love our Irish fans. I I love our Irish fans. I really do. See, I I, I feel like we're rock stars, Goody, when I say that. It's like, we've got (laughs) fans. You got no fans. But I did offend the barmaid at the airport uh, in the bar where what it was did you four, do? Points, four points you of being responsible in two packets You did do, you didn't do did. that thing where you cut your fart, did you? No. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. No. 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 I basically, well, I think she'd have preferred that, to be fair, if I'd have cupped a fart and thrown it in her face, to what I actually did was order a pint of Guinness and then asked her to put some blackcurrant in it. My God, you should have seen her face when I asked for the blackcurrant. She was not happy. Not happy at all. Yeah, and she was like, "You could, here's the black currant. I'm not giving it to you. You can get it yourself and pour it in there yourself. So, um, yeah, it was lovely. Lovely touch, though. Well, before we talk a little bit more about the Champions Cup action, England named their squad for the Six Nations last week. George Ford was left out, but now he's back in because of Owen Farrell's injury. What did you make of all of that? Goody, tell me this, and I don't think we've ever spoken about this. Maybe we, we probably have. Owen Faz, Owen Farrell, good friend of mine, good friend of the show. What's the hate around him in the media? Like, have him not been in the squad? Have I, it might have been me. Did I start it or not? But well, let's start. Let, let's I start was, this off with what. Let's start on. this off with what. What's the hate in the media, Jim? Every time you talk about him, you say like, he, you know, he thought I don't like him because he thought I was shit and all this stuff. So um, there's no. Listen, I, I don't know. The big question around Owen Farrell, he hasn't played since the November internationals. Um, there's obviously always question marks. And you go back to last year's Six Nations around Eddie Jones and picking a lot of the Saracens boys that hadn't played at all. He's the only one that has been kind of granted, um, not special dispensation, but he's in the squad without being picked on form or, or fitness. So Sam Underhill, who unfortunately got injured again at the weekend, but he was he's out of the squad because Eddie Jones doesn't think he's fit. Um, he's had a few head knocks and all this stuff. So wants him to get some game time under his belt. Elliot Daly, same thing. Um, you know, he's come back from injury. He said he's best off at his, you know, playing for Saracens for a few games to get some fitness and come back. And I actually, I did a column for Rugby Pass saying that how great the squad was from Eddie Jones in terms of his picking on pure form, apart from Owen Farrell. Uh, and Orlando Bailey is the other one, obviously, with George Ford being out, but he's now back in because Owen Farrell's out. So the, I don't, the, but when, you, when you see captain you lead and you've been out injured, there's going to be questions, isn't there, around Owen Farrell. And Eddie Jones has said, listen, he, I'm picking him because he's our captain, he's our leader, he's the, you know, the energy he brings to the side in terms of the winning mentality and, um, you know, everything around the training week and, you know, obviously the leadership on the field. He, he's integral to Eddie Jones. So, um, yeah, I don't really get it, but I, I do blame you, Jim. It started with you when you said you don't like him because he said you're shit and he doesn't like you because you are shit. It, it could, could well have done. And for the influential influenza person that I am, I'm not going to, I'm, no, I'm not going to apologise for it, but I look at all the other captains, and again, I've only had a snapshot of some of the media stuff, obviously on social media, and you take that as as the rule of thumb, don't you, these days? But Alan Wynne jones a guy that I've buried. Question as well. Him. Yeah, I questioned him, but everyone else backed him in the media, and he obviously rocked up and they won the Six Nations. Johnny Sexton, same you've thing. Questioned him, you've questioned him as well, James. Of course I have. So it shows you, I've not questioned Faz though in terms of like him being in the squad or the team, but everyone else in England seems to be. But what I'm saying is... Have, have you questioned me, him? Well, I might have done, yeah, I might have done. <laughs> but I just find it a little bit weird that every other kind of tier one nation or big team, like Scotland, for example, like if Hoggy's slightly... Tier yeah, one. tier one. Tier one, yeah, tier one. Six Nations champions, you heard it here first. But every other captain... Like, of years gone by, Richard McCaw, I suppose Sam Kane got questioned a bit. Uh, Hoops, sound like I'm best mates with him. Like, Michael Hooper, Sexton, you know, Alan Wynne-Jones. There's not many people questioning. But we, So, like, the Autumn Nations Cup when Faz got injured and then Courtney was captain and everything coming out of camp was like, oh, it's a much happier place. Like, I just find it oh. very... 
I know you put, that's that, you, no, I that's put what words I read. into people's mouths. That's what I read. Or it seemed, I don't really know. I just don't understand why there is this narrative around trying to push Faz out. He's the captain. So it's like any other captain, it'd be like, mate, like Jono, for example, you're in. Like, regardless if you've got one leg, I'm not saying that Faz is Jono, but it just seems to be an underlying thing, doesn't there, about him. But anyway, he's injured. He's seemingly injured his other ankle and the, and the what you're hearing coming out of Saracens, it doesn't sound good for him. So we do wish him a speedy recovery, but obviously Ford's back in. And again, something we've not ever said, Andrew. I don't know if you agree with me. But he deserves it. He deserves he to does. be back in the squad. So yeah. it's just weird how it all works, isn't it? But there we go. Hashtag England. What do you make of Orlando Bailey's inclusion ahead of Ford originally? Uh, very bizarre. Trey bizarre. But then again, um, you know, he did it in the autumn, didn't he? Uh, with Jamie George. Left him out in the first squad. Put some inexperienced players ahead of him. And then obviously Luke Cowan Dickey got injured. So he brought Jamie George back in. Jamie George ends up starting against Australia. And then doing his knee in. So, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, it's a surprise. You cannot question George Ford's form at all for Leicester. He has been one of the players of the season. Yeah, I'd say the only better player than him in the Premiership this year in terms of impact on his team and performance week in, week out is probably Marcus Smith, uh, who's playing the same position as him. So I'd have picked George Ford and Marcus Smith in the squad with Farrell there as well, because it's an expanded squad. You know, If you think back to... Six Nations last year, um, he could only have a 28-man squad. So it was obviously reduced numbers. That's when you have to look at players that can cover different positions. And you could argue that certain players, you know, wouldn't get in because of that reason. But the Orlando Bailey one, and I'm not, yeah, I think he's a, an exciting youngster who's got a big future. Um, the only thing I did question was when Owen Farrell there and Marcus Smith is your 10 options, if you've got George Ford there as well, would Marcus Smith be just looking over his shoulder? And you want Marcus Smith to be given the reins to go out and run the attack um, as he does for Quinns and, and be the real leader from that point of view. And, you know, having George Ford there and Owen Farrell, does that undermine him? I don't know. I, you, you can only get into the mind of Eddie Jones, can't you? And when you look at the selection and everyone brings up the Vunapolas, um, you're looking at the, the, the two Vunapola boys, Billy and Mako, they ain't even top two in terms of their form at the minute, are they? If we're being brutally honest. So at Luso Prop, Mako Vinopola is behind Ellis Genge and Joe Marler without a shadow of a doubt. Billy Vinopola is behind Alex Dombrand and Sam Simmons without a shadow of a doubt in terms of form. So that doesn't then become a question. The question comes to Eddie Jones when George Ford is tearing up trees as he was and he still didn't pick him. But it's all sort of water under the bridge now because George is back in the squad and... Um, you know, obviously Farrell's out and we wish him all the best, but it's Marcus Smith's time and George Ford's got to try and put pressure on him to get back in the team, hopefully. Any other surprises in there? Surprised about a comment that I read. <laughs> <laughs> I keep going on stuff that I read. Andrew, again, Tom Curry. Yeah. Very, very good player. World class, would you say? In some facets, he certainly is world class. Um he he does give a lot of penalties away, but that is the nature of a seven that is living on the edge, competing all the time. Um, but then again, he plays at number eight for Eddie Jones. And the interesting thing, uh, and selection-wise, when you're talking about the balance of the back row, and I mentioned it earlier, Underhill's not in the squad. So for me, Curry's shifting back to seven because Underhill's not in there. And now we're looking at who's going to play number eight. And both of them had pretty big games at the weekend, didn't they, for their clubs? both getting hat-tricks in Don Brent and Simmons. So is Curry world-class? I think he certainly is in many facets of the game. But, yeah, I mean... Well, the reason but, I yeah, ask that... He, yeah, he the is. The reason I he ask is. it, because, again, Ellie Jones is talking about him or has talked about him like Richie McCall or being as good as him. And I think that that is a ridiculous statement. We're talking about the go-out of go-outs in Richie McCall. And I'm quite happy to put it out there. And albeit I haven't seen enough of their matches this season because I haven't seen a load of sale. I've seen a bit of sale and I've seen a bit of bath and they've been poor. But oh, I'll say it, mate. And I know he's injured. I think Sam Underhill was better. I do. Yeah. I mean, I, I you can get that argument. I think Curry's been a ball in hand, which is why he's perhaps shifted to eight. But he'll be back at seven now. So, yeah, I mean, Sam Underhill's got issues with concussion again. He got knocked out, sparked out at the weekend in his first game back. Big one as well. Um, so he, he definitely needs a decent chunk of time away from 
playing, and that's unfortunately going to swallow up most of the Six Nations, I should imagine, to make sure that they're doing the right thing by Sam and looking after him. Because the amount of concussions he's had over the last couple of years, you've got to be very careful with that. So it's kind of a, a question. We'll judge Tom Curry in the Six Nations as an open side when he's going to be an out-and-out out open side, hopefully, and Eddie Jones isn't going to play him at eight because that'll be either Simmons or Dombrand. Well, the Guinness Six Nations is kicking off in a couple of weeks, which means the Guinness Match Point Predictor will be back. Make sure you download the app to find out where to watch all the games and join our Predictor League with the code RugbyPod. Get your predictions in to win free pints and other great prizes, and we'll be doing our predictions next week. It was a good weekend for the French sides as well, with seven of them qualifying in the end, but there was real drama at the end of the Star Francais game, wasn't there, Goody? There was. Um, there, and surprisingly, and the history of the tournament, all I'm going to say is Morgan Parra. A few years ago, all that to do was get a losing bonus point for Claremont that had qualified. He's got a penalty with uh, the last play of the game and he's tapped and gone thinking he's got to try and win the game. So they, the French don't necessarily always know what they need to do in the latter stages of the pool to qualify. But fair play to Stade Francais. They knew they had to get a win with a bonus point and had to, that win had to be by six points or more. So... They had a penalty with the last play, or literally the last play of the game it was, from, I'm going to say about 50 metres out, 40, between 45 and 50 metres out. And the kickers whacked it and it's hit the post. Bounced back, Connacht to lose him. Um, so they try and play it out of the 22. They give a dumb penalty away, Connacht do, and he's got an easy kick to, to then win it And in terms of getting them the six-point margin. So, um, listen, Connacht were through before the kickoff, so... That was great for them. The first time they qualified for the knockout stage is the Champions Cup. Uh, but fair play to Stade Francais. Tolu Latu gets sent off for swearing at Wayne Barnes, a second yellow card. And on about 45, 46 minutes, they're about 12 points down. And a French team normally at that point crumbles, but they found it within themselves to bounce back. Connacht were in complete control, actually very similarly to how they were in complete control against Leicester the week before and then lost that game as well. So... The Connacht coaching team will be a bit frustrated, but yeah, Saffron say fair play. The pink came through. They got the win. They got one of the last places in the knockout stages for the last 16, and their prize is a Paris derby with Racing. What a turnaround from Montpellier as well. Conceded 89 last week and then turned around a bit extra this week to qualify. Imagine the meeting. Imagine the, the croissants going flying. I don't, can you even say that these days? Can, can, can you even I don't say reckon, I don't reckon they are the croissants, croissants out will go flying. after you've taken 89 points, mate. There's no croissants allowed. I'm telling you now, mate, they have croissants, win, lose, or draw. Even if you've had your pants pulled down and, and you were shitting out a bag of croissants, like they are eating croissants, full stop. Now, that is stereotyping, Andrew. What, with a cigarette yes. in their mouth as well? That is absolutely stereotyping. <laughs> I mean, that just shows you the French way. You go from, uh, look, we know the reasons why they got humped by Leinster, but there's getting humped and then there's having, let's just round up to 110. You get 110 points put on you at Leinster to then beating Exeter at home the way that they did. Like, as in, that is the French way, albeit two very different teams, but huge. Glasgow. Or is it, uh, you see, I brought it back to Scotland roughly. Poor Glasgow. We, we, they, they were holding out. Not, probably didn't deserve to go through to the last 16 based on the last couple of weeks, but who saw, who saw that at the bookies? But, well, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Obviously, both teams had destiny kind of in their own hands. Glasgow more so. They had a home game against La Rochelle. Uh, La Rochelle, and you don't expect a French team necessarily to rock up who've already qualified, and they did. So Glasgow will be frustrated. But your fair play to Montpellier, turning around that absolute pants around your ankles job in Leinster, uh, to beat in Exeter, who dominated Glasgow the week before. And they did, they bullied uh, Exeter at times, didn't they, Montpellier? Their pack was phenomenal. Um, and yeah, and then it sort of lends itself to Kovis Reinhardt getting intercepted at death or with about 10 minutes to go to, to take him clear. And yeah, it was, listen, it, it's remarkable. Everyone was slagging Montpellier off last week for the team they put out. And it's a disgrace kicking out of the competition. To do that to Exeter with a bonus point to qualify was uh, outstanding. Well, speaking of that win for Montpellier, we can have a chat now with their number eight, Zach Mercer. How are you, mate? Yeah, very good, mate. A bit sore today, but yeah, uh, happy after a good win yesterday. Zach, let's just go back a, a couple of weeks or a week, we should say. And a week is a long time in sport, as we know. 
Uh, we were speaking about the performance against uh, Leinster and it was a non-starter for you boys. And it was tough actually when people didn't realise that the kind of situation around your team and you know what you'd gone through to even put a team out. What was said after, mate? Like you said, it was um, obviously the team was very different that we sent there, and um, a lot of lads were really disappointed in how they performed. Like even though it wasn't a strong team, there was the guys that had the opportunity probably lacked a little bit of effort and desire. And um, on a Monday, it was absolutely brutal. To be honest, like you said, it was actually embarrassing and. Even though I was in the team sheet, I didn't get on the field, but just being involved in that that kind of result and the lads that even weren't involved was embarrassed because it kind of that that scoreline kind of underpinned us. Looks like oh look how shit these guys are this season, but we're sitting joint, we're sitting second in the top fourteen, mm. uh, and we're actually having a really good season. And then that result just kind of came out of nowhere. And Monday was pretty brutal, um, a lot of shouting, a lot of swearing, and a lot of honesty meetings and. Um, the only way we could deal with it was actually by winning yesterday. And that's the only way we could shut people up um, was by winning against Exeter on yesterday. And that's what we did. And when they're shouting and bawling at each other in the meeting, are you understanding it all or are you just nodding going, yeah? He's oh, no, right. look we've got a translator there. So when the so translator gets translating swear words. <laughs> Shit! Shit! Yeah. Shit! Shit! Shit. Yeah, but you can um, see how, yeah, it was disappointing that result, but obviously we backed up yesterday. Yeah, you certainly did. We'll come on to yesterday's game in a bit, but obviously going back, you were on the bench against Leinster and everyone talked about it and said, oh, you know, I was actually doing some work with BT Sport and I said, actually, the issues they've gone through, um, you know, the, the credibility of actually getting the game on is is was the right thing to do, although the credibility of the result was ridiculous. You are on the bench, you didn't get on. Are you just like, thank you, Philippe, for not getting me on the bench? <laughs> were, you, were you absolutely buzzing to get on? Well, no, I, to be honest, man, I haven't played since the 27th of December. So for me, I was like, I need, I want to play. I really want to play. And obviously the team that got put out, Philippe was like, well, we're going to need you now for the top 14 that's coming up. And obviously that's priority in France, as you guys know. And um, when it kind of got past 50, I was a bit like, because I honestly thought I was going to come on at half time and we had a bit of a stronger bench and I thought we could maybe add to the game a little bit. And obviously I didn't get on. Um, obviously the scoreline wasn't nice, but I kind of wish I was on the field with the lads to try and help them a little bit. But I got 80 minutes under my belt yesterday. I'm, I'm ready to play some rugby now. And obviously, hopefully, COVID um, doesn't play a factor now. And obviously, we're away to La Rochelle on uh, Saturday. And then, Zach, for you personally, I think we spoke to you just before you went. And again, we've said it with you on here and with you out on, on here. One of the best players in the Prem uh, last season when you've played. Obviously, a big shock. I suppose you're looking back at Bath now thinking, best decision you ever made since <laughs> second. Like, you, you, like, of course you are. And I say it because you've been carving up in France, albeit not seen many games, seen snapshots on social media, seen reports about how you've been playing. Is it as good as it looks for you out there? Oh, yeah, it is, mate. It's massively, um, it's, it's a hell of, hell of a spot here. Um, the rugby, I'm enjoying it. it. It's good. It's different. It's difficult. Um, a lot more physical. Uh, this league, you, as you guys know, like the physicality of this league is unbelievable. I mean, you look at it and everyone says, oh, it's a really tough league, but this league is ridiculous. I mean, like you said, you go to breathe at home and breathe at home are a different animal compared to when you have breathe away and every team is difficult. Um, so that in that aspect, I'm really enjoying it because every week for me is a physical test and uh, I'm playing, I'm starting, I'm, I'm getting the backing from the coaches, which is something that I, I'm, I massively miss when I was at Bath. I've got the backing from the, these guys and they signed me for being me and so I kind of just go on the field and play, play my brand of rugby and it seems to be working. And talking about your brand of rugby, another player that's got a very specific brand of rugby that we saw in the Premiership, Kobus Reinach and his intercepts. Uh, he got another one at the weekend, which basically <laughs> took you ahead and took you away from, from extra a little bit to win the game. Um, that game yesterday, was it was a phenomenal game to watch. Um, and interestingly, everyone's talking in, in England about the number eight battle between Don Brandt and uh, Sam Simmons. Sam gets a hat-trick, Don Brandt gets a hat-trick on, on Friday night. But Eddie Jones has name-checked you as well, hasn't he? Because he came to watch... You against Cast and um, yeah, there's some good news there, isn't there? Yeah, well, first of all, I spoke to Corbus actually before I came on the show, uh, and he's like, "Oh, well, I want to get on the show." So if you haven't seen yet, Corbus is keen to get on the show. There you go. Uh, um, he's an interesting character. Yeah, Corbus good luck is, to have him. Yeah, Corbus is world class. I mean, he, he, that guy. I don't know how old he is. I must be a thirty or something. I just wind him up, but his <laughs> speed is he's so fast. It's not. It's ridiculous. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, he's, he's a delight to have to be working with. I won't tell him that to his face, but yeah, I enjoy working with him. Um, but with regard to yeah, England number eight, I mean, yeah, obviously I missed out. I should have scored a hat trick yesterday. Um, but first of all, no, Don Brown, I think, and Sam are playing really good rugby at the moment. Um, I think the way their teams are played for help them massively to get into the game. I mean, everything that Quinns do relies around Marx and Alex um, and puts Don Brown into space and X is the same. I mean, like yesterday, we have a peel that makes I mean Sam's on the ball to get the opportunities to score tries like that. Um, but yeah, I've had any, I've had conversations. It's, it's funny, I we played Cass at home and um, I walked out on the pitch. I didn't know he was there and his face was on the big screen. <laughs> so I was a bit like, oh, hang on, here we go. Um, and I expected him after the game just to kind of disappear and go off. But he actually waited in the bar after, well, in the in the food room and uh, had a really good chat with him. And I think he's respected me a lot more since I've moved to France. I think he respects that I've kind of just took my own initiative and decided that I want to go develop myself. And that's what he said in, in the article. And um, yeah, it's obviously always nice to be named checked by Eddie, but obviously at the moment I'm in France, I can't play for England, so it's actually quite nice. It's just, I know where I am this season. I know I'm going to always be in Montpellier, ready playing every week, and rather than having to worry about international selection just right now. All right, so on that then, there yeah. are whispers and rumours <laughs> going around. I mean, what what is the play for you? I mean, because you've gone there, I'll reiterate, you've carved up when you've been there. You're obviously loving life. You can't turn your back on international rugby. You know that you're in that mix now. You've just said it. Um, there seems to be a little bit of movement. Obviously, Nathan Hughes has gone on loan to Bath now. Your name's been in the mix around Bristol's, Leicester as well. Can you give us anything? Or are you still oh, mate, to, to be honest, it's, probably, it's yeah, it's all unfortunate. Yeah, I'm not unfortunate. But it's all a lot of rubbish, really. There's um, there's no truth behind it. I mean, I've got this year and next year, and uh, then with an option of a, of a plus one to stay. So. Um, at the moment, I'm here in Montpellier, I'm staying and uh, obviously this time next year will be a slightly different discussion. Um, but Zach, I'll... you do know you know how the French work though, you've, you've just carved up at the weekend. If you come on here and say that you're leaving, you can go in and probably ask for 20 grand extra a month tomorrow. <laughs> 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 we give like... you, we give you. <laughs> but it's, no, mate, I'm, like, a, like you said, I'm really enjoying my rugby and uh, Obviously, I still have aspirations to play for England, but so did Stefan Armitage. Um, but he decided to stay in, in, in France. So I'm not saying that's not an option because I really do enjoy it here. Uh, the lifestyle, the rugby is great, but uh, I am still young. I do still have aspirations for, for England. And I've been very vocal with Montpellier about that. and um, So we'll see what the discussions kind of happen next year. But like you said, for me, I'm just here. I'm, I'm focused, and I do believe this team this year we can go win a top fourteen. There is, you certainly can, and there is a bit of a question around uh, a way of being able to play international rugby and stay at Montpellier because um, you got captain 2018, didn't you? Um, and now there's that three year sort of break clause, and you're Scottish as well. There's a bit of Scotland in you. Uh, and I, know, you may, I, I, thought, I thought that's the way Jim was going to go. But the last question around you can stay at Montpellier, but you could play for Scotland. I, I can't make. I did a podcast with Johnny B about two weeks ago, um, and he asked me the same question. But I actually don't qualify for Scotland on any any sort of ground. Um, oh. So unfortunately, that 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 dream's uh, gone down the drain a little bit. Have you been to Scotland? Have, you <laughs> Have been? I been? <laughs> yeah, I left there when I was seventeen. That's you're in. You're in. You've been. You're in. <laughs> <laughs> and Zach, lastly from me. Um, the Six Nations, and I want to get your gauge on the French. There still seems to be a thing where the French struggle to travel, and it still seems to be there's something still quite there. Like, what, what's your gauge on being in the French team? I'm not taking the Leinster game out of the out of the mix when we talk about this one. <laughs> do, 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 is, is it still a thing? Do you feel? Do you, do you feel that's quite a weird thing still in France, or is it kind of past yeah, that it now? I think it is weird because you, obviously you guys are playing in France. Like, there's a massive emphasis on home games. Um, you have to win them no matter what. And I feel like this team I'm in at Montpellier is, is slightly different because we beat Racing away, we beat Stade Francais away, we beat Beiritz away. We've actually, I think we're the only team in the top 14 to take a point, to take any points away from every single away game. Um, so for us, I, I, don't, I don't see it as an issue. Obviously, the Leinster won by that, but. 
Uh, it is talked about. It is really talked about. Like a lot of the teams you see when they send a team, uh, when you see the team sheet, they, they just send like a B team because I think they're just like, oh, well, we've got this team at home next week. We need to focus on that instead. And it does. It, that's the thing that frustrates me in the top 14 is that, like in the Premiership, it's like you chase every game. And then when you have Europe, it's a massive honour to play in Europe. And um, But then we put slightly different teams out in that. So it's just the French way. And to be honest, if uh, if you asked me at the start of the year, it would have really frustrated me. Um, but you kind of just get round the way of the way the French are. Uh, that's how they are and you can't change them. And you've kind of just got to embrace it and say that's how, how they do it. And just sit there and just take it in. And when you get the opportunity to play, you do it. And... But like I said, I, I want to play in every single game I can for this club. So um, it, it's frustrating sometimes when when you when you're sitting on the bench or not getting on. Apart from when you're getting humped by 89 points, but we won't go there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> say hello to Philippe for us and say I'm still waiting for my invite to team for this game. No, oh, I will do, mate. I'll send him it. He's good English, old Philippe. So he's been on the pod. Yeah, yeah, he's a good bloke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good bloke. He's a very. Yeah, good I left him a Philippe. voice note. I left him a voice note last week saying, "Say Philippe." Parkour, parkour, what happened? And he didn't reply. So, oh, I think, uh, yeah, last week was pretty brutal. So, maybe yeah. you text him that. You might text him again now. You might get a better response. Very true. Yeah, we'll do. All right, Zach. Thanks, right, sir. Cheers, Thanks, mate. Cheers, Thanks, Zach. Everyone, mate. Bye, Thanks, bye, mate. Top lad. Top lad. Yeah, top lad. Northerner. We love him, don't we? Friend Northerner. Of the show. He's been on a few times, huh? Yeah, he says what he thinks. He, you know, he, he rocks up week in, week out. I love that. I, I remember I played with players and I was one myself where you think, oh, I don't fancy it that much this week. I remember we were playing at Breve and it was Claremont away and I looked around and it was the Shags and the coach said, mate, we need we need a 10 to sort of lead the troops around. I was like, fucking Hammy's a bit sore. Um, and we got absolutely pumped by about 70 points, whereas I was I had the weekend off and went down to Toulouse for the day. But yeah, he's, he's a great guy, isn't he? Well, let's look at the other Champions Cup games from the weekend as well. It was another last gasp win for Quinns, but Cass were unlucky, weren't they? Andrew, I need you to elaborate on this because this is one of the most engaged tweets you've ever put out is around this game. Now, I didn't know the listenership from Quinns. I kind of thought in Castro we would have a higher listenership, to be honest, but there'd be that much interaction. Talking of tweets, I put a tweet out about meatloaf dying, rest in peace, and that went viral. Your tweet about the refereeing has gone viral. What, what's he done? Listen, Quinn's has qualified, so they made a few changes. Uh, yeah, Cast rocked up knowing if they got a win, they'd qualify. And they, fair play, Cast played exceptionally well. You normally, you don't associate, and I was one myself, when I sat there and I thought, oh, Cast have got no chance at Quinn's. But they rocked up. Rory Cockett at nine played exceptionally well. They had Nicosia. Is he still going? Still gearing with an arm like you wouldn't believe. His left arm is about four times the size of his right arm. Um, is that, Nico- what, what arm are you talking are You t- Actually, his left arm. And he's got like a bionic, bionic arm, mate. Um, when you say it, it's fucking weird when you look at it. Uh, but he played exceptionally well. I think, I think he's retiring at the end of the year. Uh, Nicosi, they came up with a line-out play where Nicosi's in the line-out and you're just looking, oh my God, what's the winger doing? Line-out, well, he ain't lifting, he ain't jumping. He's definitely going somewhere. He front peels. Um, and they scored from that. They fair play to cast, they rocked up and they got themselves into a position to win it. And some people are saying, listen, it's their own fault. Ben Botica missed a bucket load of kicks at goal. Yeah, you know, if they take their chances, they win the game comfortably. Ben Botica made a lovely break and then he's about to dive over the line, drops the ball as well. So they didn't help themselves. Uh, but when they're ahead with two or three minutes to go, and then Mike Adamson referees the way he refereed, let four passes go, gave two dodgy penalties to Harlequins when it, one of them was a clear penalty to cast. But more importantly, you can deal with referees making mistakes like that. There were some horrific decisions. But the most horrific decision, he gives a penalty to Harlequins and Don Brandt taps and goes to the last play of the game. And in the process of tapping and going, he's tried to score. And you know when a player knows he's scored, right? He's up celebrating. Don Brandt didn't know. And you're looking at the replay. Mike Adamson's given it on-field decision, no try. Ryan McNeese, the TMO, has looked at it and he's gone, yeah, he scored it. It's a try. And obviously when it's when the referee says it's no try on field decision, there has to be clear evidence to overturn it that a try scored. And all the replays, there's a boot on the line and he puts it down the other side of the boot so it's not over the line. There's no control. There's nothing. How Brian McNeese has come to this decision to say 
that there's enough evidence there to overturn the referee's on-field decision of a try is flabbergasted. Like, unbelievable. And Quinns didn't need the win. They'd already qualified. They couldn't have uh, finished above Leicester. So they couldn't have got top seeding as well, which meant they'd have got home games in their country all the way to the final. So it's irrelevant for Quinns. Quinns were through anyway. But Cast had the referee and the TMO not concocted a, a basically a balls up in the last three minutes. Cast would be in the knockout stages now. And I was amazed. Joe Worsley does an interview after the game. And he was very calm. And he was like, look, you know, we've got to look at ourselves. It's our own fault. If I'm a coach there, I'm going, what is the referee doing? He's had an absolute stinker. So is the TMO. Because everyone could see it, but everyone's a bit, a bit too scared to say anything. So it was, listen, you know, Cast can feel very hard done by. And, you know, it's a real shame. And it's so obvious that it wasn't a try to me that it made the, the decision an absolute joke. But with French teams and Joe Worsley's probably he's probably penned in a holiday for the knockout stage. <laughs> he's sinking. Yeah, so maybe. A bloody chance that we are winning this. So he's probably like that. He's oh god, thanks. Oh god, I'm so sad. <laughs> and Gerda, you were in Ireland for Wasps' defeat at Munster. Were you surprised at how they approached the game? I wouldn't say how they approached the game. Their accuracy was poor. They got bullied, uh, physically dominated by. By Munster as well, and they yeah, they made three errors that led to three tries. Which Munster have only ever lost five games in the Champions Cup at Tottenham Park in 26 years. So when you come up with that stat, they've only lost five games in European rugby across 26 years of it. It's phenomenal. So it's a tough place to go. Wasps have had an incredibly tough couple of weeks uh, physically. They weren't at the races. They made a couple of errors. You know, there's a chip kick for. Tom Zebo to score his first try that took him uh, to be top try scorer for Munster in in Europe, um, where Dan Robson's kind of hands on hips, he should be covering the chip space. Um, so they've just sort of mastered their own downfall, really, knock-ons and, and stuff that gifted Munster possession. But Munster are bloody good. Coombs at number eight. My God. Yeah, Gavin Coombs. Him, he's good, mate. Yeah, The size of him, the speed of him, the power of him. Um, I spoke to Graham Roundtree before the game. Uh, he came over, we had a big What's he for me? He said to say hello to Jim. He said he loves the podcast. He listens every week. Keep calling him Wigsville. And I've said basically on comms that he should get the job for Munster. So, Graham, we are putting our votes in for you to be Munster DOR next season when Van Graham leaves. But we can't say that because he said don't say anything. But we want him to get the job. I'm, a, I'm all ears on this. I'll put, see what I've done. Because I've got the <laughs> <Nice. laughs> and also we're impressive again against... Come on, wouldn't they? Ulster. Now, I don't know whether Stevie Ferris has listened to the podcast. We know he does, friend of the show. And I said, I don't think Ulster can win the Champions Cup. Stevie begs to differ. He reckons they can. And Stevie is their biggest critic as well. So if Stevie thinks they're good enough to win the Champions Cup, then so do I, because I flip-flop and I'm easily converted. But that is a statement win for Ulster because of what they've done in recent weeks and because they're a big French team. So the questions around Ulster, and I said it last week, can they step up when that physicality is turned on? And you look at the competition now, going to the last 16, it's, without just giving a throwaway comment, it is wide open. Like, genuinely, you look at... And I say that off the back of Montpellier doing what they did to Exeter as well. So it's so hard to call. And... I revoked my statement from last week. Ulster in the mix because Stevie Ferris said so and I'm within. But yeah, they, they, listen, Ulster are a proper outfit. We've said it week in, week out. They didn't have McCluskey, they didn't have Cooney. Uh, Dope comes in at nine again, plays very well. I thought Billy Burns controlled things nicely at 10. Balakoon on the wing. And I keep saying it, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but Mike Lowry was on fire. I just find him weird without his scrum cap. He needs his white scrum cap back on. Um, but he was phenomenal as well. So, Ulster, proper outfit. Bath were always going to be up against the, the Rick to Leinster, weren't they? I mean, I mean it was yeah. it was an island team run slash training session. Jeez, Bath, that's their biggest ever defeat at home at the Rec. That's my point, speaking to Caelan Doris, obviously, last week. So, let's put an island hat on, because we're close to the Six Nations, we're excited. Them Leinster players, they ain't been tested. 
They've got Cardiff. No disrespect to Cardiff. Leinster will probably make wholesale changes. And going into the Six Nations, undercooked, would you say? You know, Ulster, obviously, have got to get some players in the mixer as well. But we know the backbone of the Ireland team is Leinster. No disrespect to Cardiff. You know, they're going to make changes in that game. I mean, like, do you know what I mean? Like, how, how do you go into a Six Nations, like, all guns blazing, like, ready to go? Just come out of Europe, had some really close games, like test matches. Leinster naturally would rest players in the URC this week going into the Six Nations. Like, that's the hard thing about this, isn't it? That's what I mean. That's where the golf for this Leinster team in Ireland, where I don't think it's good. Whereas you look at England, you look at Scotland, you, know, you look at France as well, they're going to be fully loaded. Why have I not mentioned yeah. Wales? Why have I not mentioned Wales in that? Well, you never do. You don't like them. And they have I do like Wales. In Europe. I do. I want to but that's Europe. what I mean. That's my point. Uh, they're going to be primed. Yeah, it's. I mean, you can only beat what's put in front of you, and and Leinster absolutely dispatched Bath in every area. Jimmy O'Brien four tries, um, first ever Leinster player to do that in Europe. They were just so clinical, and it's the thing. I mean, you're right, Jim. Are they undercooked or are they primed and fresh and ready to go? You know, they're not absolutely flogged. They haven't got loads of injuries. Um, I think Ireland are in a very good place off the back of beating New Zealand in the autumn. Um, you know, the players have played a couple of games for their provinces, but they're not overcooked in terms of energy reserves because they've had to slog it out week to week to week. So, yeah, I, I think Ireland are in a very good place. They're favourites, I think, for me to win the um, all France or England, just not Scotland. Glasgow were in a good place as well, weren't they, Jim? But they couldn't quite overcome La Rochelle. Just dropped off, haven't they? Last couple of weeks, with again, without stating the obvious. I think that extra game kind of took the wind out of their sails a little bit. Probably a bit of a humbler, really. And the difference is with, obviously, Edinburgh and Glasgow, is Edinburgh, with all due respect, are in a much easier competition. So I think for, for Glasgow, they've lost a bit of momentum. But again, you look at the quality of opposition without going around salary cap and all these things and making excuses. Oh, careful. You're not really, in my opinion, expected to beat a La Rochelle. Like, I just don't know how. And they did compete. You know, they did compete. And they, you know, competed for 50 minutes against Exeter the week before. A little bit of a humbler. But I think last week's game took the wind out of the sails. And, you know, they're out now. You know, you, you take take the destiny out of their own hands. And they probably, well, a lot of us didn't see Montpellier beating Exeter off the back of the week before. But Montpellier second in the top 14. And like a lot of the media in Scotland are saying, they don't deserve to be in the last 16. So uh, Glasgow aren't far away. They've shown that throughout the season. They've shown that in, in Europe as well. That win against Exeter at home was phenomenal. Uh, but they'll be back and, you know, they are a quality team. Well, Glasgow just missed out on qualification for the knockout stages, but the other Scottish side was a big winner at the weekend. And we can have a chat now with Edinburgh head coach, Mike Blair. How are you, mate? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you getting on? Mike, we're very good. Look, I've got to be honest, I've just come back off holiday. My research has been minimal over the last few days. And before you came on, there was actually a bit of an argument brewing here because we're former teammates, you captain, me, your vice captain. At least that's how I remember it for Scotland. Uh, you might remember it differently, but let's keep that raw. Did you play anywhere else? Did you play in Breathe? Like, the lads are telling me you did. I'm saying you didn't. Yeah, I, I played for a year. Um, I played the year after Goody took all the money, I think. There was no hey, money. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think Goody, Ricky, <laughs> Goody, Ricky Flutie, Jamie Noon um, took them all their money and there's pretty much nothing left for me. But um, no, I, I, kept that club, I kept that club afloat, mate, just like Newcastle saved them from relegation. Another club that you played at. Um, <laughs> we're having this debate, you see. I'm like, mate, he's played at a couple of clubs that I played at. And Jim's like, nah, mate, he was just Edinburgh till he dies. I'm like, yeah. I'm telling you now, he was at Breathe, he was at Newcastle and all this stuff. I'm like, it, He's a man from my own heart. Maybe we should have played together, but our, our swords never got to cross, did they? Well, I'll tell you the first time I came across you, Goody, and it's a it's a weird one that that you remember these things. But you played England under twenty ones against Scotland under twenty ones at I can't remember it was, but it was a six. You won by sixty points. Can you remember? It? No doubt, mate. No doubt. Was it at Rugby Lions? I absolutely <laughs> dominated. Uh, it could be the pitch was the pitch um, was frozen. Rock hard. Yeah, I, I, Rugby I, Lions. I, I didn't. I didn't get on. Um, but um, 
I remember afterwards, and it's one of these weird things you remember that um because James, you're playing with James Grindle. Yeah. So James Grindle's wife, Anna, I used to play mixed doubles with her um in Edinburgh. So she was just, leave it, just, the, just leave it there. Don't say anything else about what happened after the after the mixed doubles. No, I remember seeing you um you're having a coffee, but you're spooning like uh, brown sugar straight from the spoon into your mouth. So you no doubt, that's, that's me. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't putting in your coffee, it was straight from the spoon. <laughs> Mate, I'm probably still doing the same now, just straight chocolate now though. <laughs> hey, we're trying to keep his blood sugar levels high across all the boys, and the only way we filled that blade is by brown sugar and camels, that's all we know. So, hey, it's been a long time... Uh, Mike, it's been a long time coming. You, it's been Scottish rugby has been fenced off, but now we are absolutely flying. To quote one of the main journalists out there, Jim Hamilton, phenomenal is what I've used on many occasions this season to talk about Scottish teams. Let's park Glasgow. Let's just park Glasgow now. We can talk about them in a few weeks, but we'll get into it. Edinburgh, hashtag always, absolutely flying. So it's awesome to have you on. I've been working on the Premier Sports stuff. Um, Mike, you've been very receptive around the media, not just in terms of how you speak about your team, but also trying to engage the fans and engage the community. Well, I, I think it, it sounds a bit cliche, but we're, we're in the entertainment industry, aren't we? Like, we're, we're here to entertain. Yes, we are. And, and the better product we can put on the pitch, um, the more uh, fans we're going to get, the happier they're going to be, the bigger crowds we're going to get, the more revenue that you get, the more guys are going to enjoy themselves. So there's a kind of um, a circle around it, um, you know, and, and, and it is important for us. I, I spoke after one of the games, uh, who did we, we beat? Some, uh, I think we beat Benetton at home. And I was asked after, oh, what did you think of the game? And I said, oh, I, I didn't think we entertained the crowd. And, and the journalist said, well, is that important? I said, yeah, I think it's important. You look at the, the not only to put on a a good spectacle to make people come there, but I also think that that the game is leaning towards teams that play a little bit more, being more successful. We saw that with with Harlequins, um, and and I, I think that's for, for me that's the way that um, that we're going to be successful um, is is playing a brand of rugby that moves the ball quickly, that uh, that's physical. And, uh, and allows you to play on top of teams. And looking at, obviously, since you've taken over, you, listen, you're sitting top of the URC. Um, it's phenomenal to see, you know, you're putting tries on teams of fun. Obviously, there were 66 points scored at the weekend. But has there been a seismic shift, from, in your opinion, of, from when you took over to how the team is playing now? Uh, obviously, we know Coppers is a very different coach in terms of forward-orientated and quite aggressive, whereas there seems to be this, this bit of a change of... of how the players are led on the field. They lead themselves and there's a bit more jure jure there. Yeah, I think, first of all, and I, I said it kind of in my introduction meeting to the players and I've, I've said it numerous times since. What what Cocker did at the club was has had a, a big influence on, on where the club, I guess, are at the moment because we talked about um, the foundations of a team and the foundations of a team is around your your physicality, um, your defence, which, which Cal McRae is still doing a, a great job with. But what I wanted to do was, was one, was to, to make the guys uh, look forward to coming to training and, and enjoy the way that we're trying to play. Um, so that, that's first and foremost. But part of that is, is winning rugby as well. So you need to have those foundations in place that you can build. So when the weather's not so good, like a Saracen's away, like you can go back to those foundations and you can rely on your, your kick chase game, your defense um, to suffocate teams. But when you get a dry ball um, and, and we're fortunate with the pitch, we've got the, the damn health now that um, it does dry up quickly, even if it's been a bit wet, like it does lean towards playing a, a faster game. So I guess, you know, who knows that had Cocker been here next year, there might have been a faster game that the Edinburgh played to, to suit the, the stadium. But uh, no, I've just, I've, I've, um, I've really enjoyed trying to challenge the players, their, their leadership, giving them more ownership and, on what they're doing, letting them speak more in meetings. I'm sure they still think I speak too much, but, but letting them take control of, of things, how, you know, potentially putting across our discussions to the group rather than it always being me putting those, those points across. And then what about being a coach, Mike? You've obviously coached at Glasgow, as we know, Scotland, and it was a big move probably for you to come across and become head coach and be making decisions around 
contracts as well as you know who's going to be playing, picking the team. And I know we've had some of these discussions at the start of the pitch as well, but maybe just for our listeners, it all seems like it's all rosy and it's an easy gig when you're winning. What's it like being a young head coach of a top of the table URC team? I find it massively stressful. <laughs> and I'd like, I may, maybe I shouldn't be saying it to you because I try and give off an aura of being relaxed and, and uh, you know, casual the whole time, as, as you know, I'm usually like, but I, I, I do find it really stressful. There are, there are little t- moments and there's, there's no reason why that you feel little bites of, of anxiety about, you know, a team selection coming up or um, having to speak to a player about a contract or, you know, maybe something not going that well in a game. And, and, and it's not something that you, you can control. Like I, I know people who have, have had anxiety and I've kind of said to them, you know, that's not that bad. Just, just forget about it. But you find yourself in that situation and, and there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, so I, I do, I've, I've loved the job hundred percent, but I, I do find it, I do find it really difficult at times. And, and that's where it's important to be surrounded by the right people. Um, and the coaches, um, in particular guys, guys around me have been really helpful and, and taken some of that stress off me and, and it helps being able to talk things through with them as well. But no, it's, um, it's, um, it's an all encompassing job. It's, it's on your mind 24 hours. And just on that note, obviously you shared a fair few changing rooms with Jim Hamilton in your time. Now you're a head coach. How the hell would you manage that specimen day in, day out? The sapping, the way he bought himself. One of the things I noticed, you said, I wanted guys to come to training every day and enjoy it and look forward to coming to training. That bloke never did, did he, Jim Hamilton? So how would you dealt with someone like him? Oh, the rock stars, you just got to let them be, don't you? (laughs) (laughs) I'll, I'll, I'll you I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, actually. Sorry, Jim. I, I feel like I'm I'm picking on you here, but um, I remember there was um, there was a bit of a chat. I think you'd written an article about um, the Scotland South Africa game and how Scotland just lacked physicality. This was when you're. This is Jim Hamilton, the journalist, not not the rock star. And uh, and you I played, said, was like, it was it mainstream media or was it rugby pod talking crap and saying a lot of things that I don't I really mean? It, it might have been the Times. My, well, that's, uh, main, that's, that's mainstream yeah that's real um, and it was something like you know Scotland just lacked the physicality and need to be more physical and stuff and there was a clip going around of when you played against South Africa <laughs> <laughs> and what the, happened did I dominate both of them no, it what was, was it it was just the opposite of physicality we were like, <laughs> <laughs> we were, you just two, said you're going to be nice. I thought we were going to tell two, a story about being nice. There were two South Africans, I think, like going for the jackal, and you you came in and you like you lost your footing just before you had it. You tried to kind of turtle roll, and you felt I was just it was just it was a shame to to see it, but I, I thought it was very very amusing seeing this. What on one side you got this article about Scott and we got more physical, and then there was this other clip going around about you. Um, um, maybe not being quite as physical. I never saw the clip. No one sent me the clip. So it was an in-house joke, basically, <laughs> that I never saw that I wasn't a part of. Right. Jim, I've been talking Jim, to you ever since. You've basically been getting buried by all the lads. It's literally like me coming out and giving fitness advice, Jim. Actually, you know, just absolutely ridiculous. Say you're physical and then being soft as anything at the breakdown. Well, let's talk about Scotland then, because obviously the, the Calcutta Cup game coming up in uh, two weeks' time up in Edinburgh. There's going to be fans there, which is amazing after Nicola Sturgeon has, has changed the laws around what you can and can't do. But Scotland are in a great place, aren't they, in reality? And as much as Jim and I sit here and debate, I say he's English, but he's not, he's Scottish. The rugby that they've played and the place that they're in as a squad, part of that is massively to do with Edinburgh and your coaching. Is it, They're on an upward curve. Is it their time to win the Six Nations? Jim reckons they're going to win it. it it's really difficult because you... Like, I think Scotland are in a really good place. At the moment. I didn't think we played particularly well during the autumn. But to not play particularly well and, and beat Australia, who'd, who'd beat New Zealand a couple of times prior to that, um, was a bit of a statement, I think. Uh, so when you're not playing well and you're winning games, I think Japan could have been, um, um, what do you call it? A banana, a banana skin. Banana skin. Yeah, yeah banana, banana skin. skin. Um, but, um, but they put them away quite comfortably in the end. Um, so on, on that basis, you're thinking, you know, Scotland have got a really good chance in the, in the championship. But then you've got to remember that there are other teams in the championship as well who are going all right. You know, France, uh, you know, beat, um, 
beat New Zealand comfortably. Ireland beat New Zealand. Wales won it last year. England should be really strong. Like they, they've, England have got the best group of players, you know, arguably in the world to, to pick from. So they, they should be, um, you know, challenging for the top spot as well. And, and Italy, not to kind of take the mickey with them, but like Benetton have been really good. They really, they, they, um, they beat us. They're, um, they beat Glasgow. They've got some cracking players in there. So like on their day, they can do something as well. So it, you know, the, the question about how well Scotland are going, I think Scotland have been in a really good position going into it. And there's a really strong squad, arguably one of the strongest squads they've, they've ever selected, but other teams are looking pretty strong as well. So um, I think it'll come down to fine margins. Mike, I just want to get a gauge now that you've opened yourself up to the media and we're speaking so candidly and basically you told me that that clip was going around around that South Africa game. So you could be honest with us. Um, and I say this having been a passionate Scotsman as a rugby player, as a coach, but now coaching a team in which you need a mix of players from where they come from. And my point being, I look at the Scotland squad now and there's been a few things going around in the media that has been the last couple of years about lads that are truly Scottish or lads that have been brought in as project players. You know, Andy Christie, which was a bit of a, a weird one for me coming in. I don't know whether Luke Crosby's injured or or not because he seems to have leapfrogged him. But how you feel about it as a coach now, having been on the inside with Scotland, but also wanting Scotland to do well, Edinburgh to do well, and bringing up guys, probably similar to myself, who didn't grow up in the system, but kind of leapfrog other players to get the opportunity for the better of the team. Do I'm Van der Mover, for example. We would not be the same team without him because he can do things that Scottish players just don't have the ability to do. Yeah, it, it, it's a really good question. I think it depends on it depends on the type of person as well, doesn't it? Like how how the accepting they are of of effectively kind of turning Scottish. Some guys like the project players, but you've got the other guys who are the who are like the exiles coming through. And I, I'd say some of the most passionate people playing for Scotland are are exiles who who don't have a Scottish accent, who haven't lived in Scotland. Like you know, Sam Skinner, for example. I think he'll be one of the most passionate guys playing for Scotland. I know he, he spoke about getting his first cap as, as probably being the, the best day of his life. So, you know, there, there are, it, it depends on the person, I reckon. Yeah, du- Duane van der Merwe has, has massively bought into um, the Scottish environment. Um, you know, VP, VP Nell as well, 45, 45 caps where he's effectively a, a kind of project player, isn't he? But, but he, is a, he is a passionate Scotsman um he, he wants to he wants to perform for Scotland he wants to perform for the crowd and he's he's massively engaged in what Scotland is trying to do so I think as long as players show that um they're kind of devoted to Scotland and going to put their bodies on the line for Scotland and they're eligible for Scotland then you know you you want the best guys playing and is there uh, any sort of initiation for, for these perceived project players slash guys that haven't been born and bred in Scotland, like something to do with a haggis, something to do with, you know, kilt and some DP or anything like that. There's got to be something, hasn't there? Come on. Did you have your initiation at Breathe? Uh, I don't think I did. No, well, I don't the know what the it haircut. was. The haircut. Oh, yeah, they uh, one of them tried to shave my head, so I knocked him out with the prop. <laughs> <laughs> Pascal Idiot there. Horrible uh, man he was. It's a big French thing, isn't it? The haircut, the haircut before your first, um, yeah. your first game. Yeah. Um, uh, is there initiation? No, like there's a there's a song in the bus. You've got to do your, you've got to do your flyer of Scotland um, by yourself on the bus after the captain's run. Just a, um, a a lyric check, and it's it's really you're really tighten it. Like even the kind of little words, you've got to get them exactly right, or you get booed off. Um, so it can be it can be quite intimidating up there. Uh, but mo- most guys get through it pretty well because they know it's coming. And Mike, before you go, let's just touch on the first game, which is the Calcutta Cup. I've never won it. I drew, I drew against the English once, but it weren't through lack of trying or physicality. But you've won it. Uh, I don't know how many times. I know you've definitely won it once. How many times have you won it, Mike? So, as a player or a coach? Both. Uh, go on, hit us go. with it. Go on. So, 2006, 2008 as a player, uh, 2018, 2020 and 2021 as a coach. Look Basically, Scotland's Scotland's most successful ever person in the Calcutta Cup. No one's won it more yeah. times, I don't reckon. I think I've had this uh, conversation with Gregor. 
I think Gregor claims to have won it one, I think one more, th- he won it in 93, 99. Um, I think he won it one other time. So I think he's one ahead of me, but. All right. Well, bloody hell. I bet it was great. <laughs> but you didn't, you didn't awesome. win it one. You didn't well, win it one. No, no I, brought, I got stretched off in 2008, the game before against Ireland. A lineup all landed on me. Uh, my legs snapped in half. I didn't flinch, but the oxygen came out and I went off on a stretcher. But it's look, all right. It sounds like it must have been great, Blade. But what is it like <laughs> and how big is it? Because we do, I mean, we saw last year, it was very different with no fans. But again, we're going over a bit of old ground, but I suppose for our listeners and building up the atmosphere and the energy to what's going to be a phenomenal phenomenal game at BT Murrayfield. First up, the narrative naturally around it from last year, this is putting 50 points on the English, but how big a game is it? What is it like as a player and a coach in the build-up to it? I think there's a... The, the, the main part of it is the balance between the emotion of playing in the game and, and getting yourself in the right headspace, but also being kind of ice cool around it so your decision making spot on so you're kind of winning every moment within the game you know if the game gets a bit heated it's it's how you control yourself how you get yourself back into the game because there's no doubt that the Scotland England game is is one of the most emotional games you're playing uh, from a, a player's point of view but also the crowd's point of view I think the crowd will get into a, into a Calcutta Cup game even more so than than any other game so so getting the crowd on side getting the crowd behind you. Um, and I, I believe at, at BT Murrayfield, if you got the crowd behind you, like it's, it's worth an extra couple of points as well. So it'll be really, really interesting to see how the, how the game goes, what the, what the selections will be. You mentioned Andy Christie there. Um, Luke Crosby is injured at the moment. Um, but, but Andy Christie is someone that, that, you know, when I was involved with, with Scotland, it was, it was someone that a player who we'd kind of kept our eyes on and probably for the last, um, you know, two and a half years or something. The fact he's getting a little bit more rugby at Saracens now, putting him in the spotlight more, uh, pushes in, him in that picture. And I think it was Mark McCall said that, you know, don't be surprised once he, he, he gets on the training pitch in front of the Scotland selectors uh, to see him starting games soon. So looking forward to seeing him go. And the magician, Finn Russell, coming up against Marcus Smith. But you can't wait to watch that, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a bit of a cock-off, isn't it? Who can... Uh, who can, who, who can... <laughs> Not something you'd win that, Jim. Um, I... Oh, come <laughs> on, Rob. I've got the pictures. Hold on, let me get the pictures out. I've got the pictures. Um, but you, 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 you build it up, and and like if it's if it's Finn against Marcus Smith, it'd just be brilliant. When I understand in the Lions that they got on really well, um, and and both of them want to play the game in the right way, and they've both got this unbelievable talent, not only to execute but to see space. Um, and uh, yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a great head to head. All right, Mike. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Piece of luck for the rest of the season, then enjoy that Calcutta Cup. Thanks a lot, Jim. I apologise for kind of. Uh, apologise. Yeah, Just being honest, mate. Be no. more comfortable. But honesty is what we are about on this podcast. So it's you know it is what it is. So I'll have a think about how I'll describe you after. So, but cheers, Mike. Thanks for coming on, mate. <laughs> thanks, Mike. Really appreciate it. Top man. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Top bloke. Shit bloke. Oh, <laughs> top bloke. Yeah. Mate, he's very good. He's yeah, absolutely yeah, rinsed you. He, we didn't he, even might get... be, he might be understanding the worst Scotland captain I've ever had, I'll be honest. And if he is thinking, <laughs> if he is thinking that Finn's got a bigger slipper than me, then he is. I don't know what he's been doing today. I don't know, but he's he's talking absolute rubbish. He might have been right on the South African thing, but I'm a bit sad about that as well. But yeah, he's all right. He's a good bloke. He's a good bloke. He's doing very I'm just well. Amazed. I'm not very happy. Matt, I'm just amazed you've called him the shittest captain Scotland's ever had, but he's one of the most successful ever Scottish players and coaches to win the Calcutta Cup. Oh, Cups. did he tell us? That, just off the yeah, top of his head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, what a bloke, though. Um, I, I do love it when, listen, he, the job he's doing at Edinburgh, for him to come on and be that open is, is pretty good, isn't it? Because a lot of head coaches just get put behind this barrier of, I can't actually take the piss out of someone. I can't. You know, have a laugh with them and you know talk about our small Jim's Williams and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Gertie. Thanks, producer Tristan. And thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to vote for us at sportspodcastawards.com. Check out eventbrite.co.uk if you fancy coming along to one of our live shows. And make sure you have subscribed on Spotify. Rugby spot. Spotify pod 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 pod. pod. <laughs>